Okay, class. We're going to talk chapter nine, the knee joint. This is a great uh, lab because we all have knee issues, um, and you're going to see a lot of athletes and clients with knee issues, so it's good to uh, know as much as you can about the knee. All right, Derek Rose. I just love this guy. You know, poor guy, he just had some bad luck. Uh, uh, bilateral ACL, meniscus, um, so... Unfortunately, he's not the same uh, Derek Rose that we knew from the Bulls. He's still a good player, but uh, bilateral knee issues. And you're thinking, well, how come some uh, NBA players or just basketball players in general have more knee issues than others? Uh, some of it's genetics. Sometimes it's uh, timing. Uh, sometimes it's just bad luck. Um, we'll go over some of the, the mechanics of it and see if uh, uh, Derek Rose is truly uh, cursed. Um, we'll see. All right, so the knee joint, uh, it's the largest diarthroidal joint in the body. A very complex. Uh, a lot of times people think the knee is simple. No, the knee is very complex. It's primarily a hinge joint, but it does have a screw home mechanism that I'll show you uh, how that works uh, later on. What are the bones? Well, you've got enlarged femoral condyles that articulate on the enlarged tibia condyle. So here's the femur, and here's the tibia, and then you have the fibula right here. Top of me medial and lateral tibial condyles or medial and lateral tibial plateau. So here's the tibial plateau, receptacles for femoral condyles. So again, here's the femur, here's the medial condyle, lateral condyle, here's the tibia, tibial plateau. Kobe Bryant actually broke this tibial plateau here. So this is not Kobe Bryant, but here's the tibial plateau fracture right here. See that? Ouch. And that's a crazy tibial plateau. Most people that have basketball tibial plateau is just a crack right here that doesn't uh, have this uh, severe of an accident. But that could have. How does this happen? Uh, car accidents, trauma, snowboarding, uh, <clears throat> mostly extreme trauma. Basketball, you can get uh, small little uh, micro tears, micro <laughs> micro fractures. Sorry. So the tibia is the medial bone. Uh, bears most of the body weight, so the tibia bears most of the body weight. That's why you can see that tibial plateau fractures uh, can occur because it bears most of your weight. Uh, fibula is lateral, serves as the attachment for knee joint structures. It does not articulate with the femur or patella, and it's not part of the knee joint. Okay, so that's a good uh, quiz question right there. So the fibula is technically not part of the knee joint. It's also not a weight-bearing uh, uh, joint. Okay. Oof, look at that. Ah, just looking at that gives me the create. Look at that. Yeah, that's his tibia right there. That is his tibia. And that's, yes, that's his leg right there. And that, yes, that's the tibia and the fibula. So you're thinking, oh, okay, why does this happen? These are elite athletes. And you're thinking, how can this occur? Well, like I gave you the example, and uh, is you can't build a skyscraper on wooden stilts. So a lot of these athletes grew up in underprivileged uh, societies, and the first two years of life is something that I always emphasize, that that's basically lays the foundation for how tall you're going to be, and basically lays the foundation of how uh, strong you're going to be. So a lot of these athletes uh, um, grew up, and they didn't have the best nutrition. You know, a little soda here, cheese uh um, Whiz, uh, Cheetos, all that stuff, that's, that's really bad for you. And if you don't have good nutrition early on, then that plays a role later. So when you guys have kids, make sure for the first two years of life, you really take care of them and have the proper nutrition that they need. All right, so the patella. <laughs> patella. Sesamoid or floating bone embedded in the quadriceps and patellar tendon. Uh, similar to a pulley, uh, creates improved angle of pull, resulting in greater mechanical advantage. So the patella is very important. It gives you a mechanical advantage in knee extension. Patellas break. Uh, how do you uh, break a patella or fracture? You land right on it. So knee, kneecap fractures are very common. What do they do? They usually wire it. So the problem is because it gives you a mechanical advantage, um, patients that come in usually have a very difficult time bending that knee afterwards. All right, what are some key bony landmarks? Uh, superior and inferior patella poles. You have the tibial tuberosity, uh, Gerdes tubercle right in here, uh, medial lateral femoral condyles, upper and anterior medial tibial surface, and then the head of the fibula. So when you palpate or 
uh, on yourself or on a patient, you can easily palpate all these bony landmarks. Some of you, if you look at your tibial tuberosity, you have this uh, bump. And um, boys will get this a lot if they grow, their bones grow faster than their soft tissues. They grow too fast. So like in the eighth or ninth grade, you had a, a sudden uh, growth spurt. And what happens is you'll get this little uh, bump right here. It's called, it's actually called Oshkut Schlatter's disease. It's not really a disease, but they label it that where basically you get this little bump here. And during that time, it's very painful for boys to run, jump, and usually you grow out of it by 18. Uh, but during that time, it's uh, a little painful. All right, you have uh, three vasti muscles of the quadriceps originate on the proximal femur, insert on the superior pole of the patella. Okay, insertion is ultimately on the tibial tuberosity via the large patellar tendon. And then you have the IT band tract of tensor fascia latte that inserts on Gurdy's tubercle. And we talked a lot about the IT band last time, so... What are the muscles? Sartorius, gracilis, semitalis insert just below the medial condyle on the upper anterior lateral tibial surface. Semimembranosus inserts posterior medially on the tibial, on the medial tibial condyle. The biceps femoris inserts on the fibular head. And the popliteus originates on the lateral aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. The popliteus uh, muscle is actually a very interesting muscle. Uh, and I think uh, we talked about this in class when we had live class is that um, if that gets tight, it's responsible for the screw hole mechanism. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but sometimes it can mimic, mimic uh, meniscal pain. So I've had some patients that after doing some soft tissue to the popliteus, they actually felt a lot better. Uh, tibial collateral ligament reduced on the medial aspect of the upper medial femoral condyle and starts on the medial tibial surface. You have the fibula collateral originates on the lateral femoral condyle, very close to the popliteus. So the origin and inserts on the fibular head. Okay. So the knee joint itself, knee joint proper or the tibial femoral joint, it's classified as a ginglimus joint. Okay, sometimes referred to as a trochoglinglimus joint because internal external rotation occurred during flexion. So when you bend the knee, you get a little internal external rotation. Some argue for the condyloid classification, but for test purposes, We'll call it a ginglimus joint. The patellofemoral joint, classified as an arthroidal, owing to the gliding nature of the patella on the femoral condyles. So as you know, the kneecap will glide. As you bend your knee, your kneecap should glide inferior. And as you extend the knee, the kneecap or the patella should glide superior. Ligaments, knee ligaments are very important. Uh, the one that you always uh, hear about is the ACL, but uh, ligaments should provide static stability. Um, quadriceps and hamstrings contractions produce dynamic stability. So a lot of times uh, people uh, forget this, but remember, your muscles, your quads, your hamstrings, more so your hamstrings, provide dynamic stability when you're running, jumping, uh, cutting, all that stuff. Your ligaments only provide static stability when you're in stationary position. So if you have weakness in your quadriceps and hamstrings, mostly hamstrings that don't give you dynamic stability, you'll tear your ligaments. Okay. So articular cartilage protects surfaces on femur and tibia. So here's the injuries to the meniscus. Uh, you uh, had a couple of you that actually have uh, torn your meniscus. Uh, unfortunately, because the blood supply is very poor, you really can't, unfortunately, heal. Um, so once you have a tear, that's it. And so here's an oblique tear. Here's a longitudinal tear. Here's a radial tear. Okay. So a lot, sometimes if you get uh, injuries to the red zone, sometimes they can, it's not as dangerous as if you have injuries to the white zone where unfortunately they don't heal. Okay. So the outer third has a little bit of blood supply, whereas the inner two thirds does not. All right, so again, you're not responsible for doing these tests, but if you're going to athletic training, if you're going to physical therapy, you'll always hear about these tests. So what tests can you do to rule out a meniscal injury? Okay, so there's McMurray's, uh, which is this way, you, so examiner applies one hand at the knee along the medial meniscus. Examiner's other hand holds the foot and ankle. You externally rotate the foot and apply a valgus stress at the knee. 
I'll show you some uh, YouTube videos of McMurray's test, Thessaly's test, Apley's test. Okay. And then you have the Thessaly test. I like this one. This is a quick and dirty way of uh, testing for the meniscus. I never just do one. I'll do McMurray. I'll do Thessaly, Apley's. And then if they have joint line tenderness, and they'll ask them about mechanism injury. So you never just ever want to rely on one test. You want to ask uh, a couple of questions. They form uh, cushions between the bones. Uh, they're attached to the tibia, not the, the femur. Uh, they deepen the tibial plateaus, and they enhance stability. The medial meniscus forms a receptacle for the medial femoral condyle, and the lateral meniscus receives the lateral femoral condyle. And you get more injuries on the medial meniscus. Um, it's also thicker on the outside border and tapered down to be very thin on the inside border, so it's um, easier to tear the inside. And unfortunately, the inside is what has less of a blood supply. Uh, can slip about slightly and are held in place by various ligaments. Uh, medial meniscus is larger and more open uh, C appearance, and the lateral um, meniscus is a closed C configuration. Either or both meniscus may be torn in several different areas from a variety of mechanisms, resulting in varying degrees of problems. Tears often occur due to significant compression and shear forces during knee rotation while flexing or extending during a quick directional changes in running. Uh, soccer is notorious for ACL injuries, but football, basketball, you name it, all the sports that require quick movements and quick change of direction. The anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, uh, they cross within the knee between the tibia and the femur. They're vital in maintaining anterior and posterior stability, respectively, as well as rotary stability. Anterior cruciate ligament or ACL injuries, one of the most common serious injuries to the knee, usually takes about a year to recover from. Uh, mechanism often involves non-contact rotary forces associated with planting, cutting, and landing in a valgus position. All right. Uh, disrupted by hyperextension or violent quadriceps contraction, which pulls the tibia forward on the femur. Now, the PCL uh, uh, is not often injured, uh, injured because of direct contact with an opponent or playing, but one of the most common ways that I've seen uh, patients injure their PCL is in a car accident where their knee, uh, the tibia rams right into the dashboard, and then it'll push that tibia backwards, and it'll tell, tell their ACL, uh, I'm sorry, PCL. But gymnasts also have a tendency to tear their PCL. All right, the fibular or lateral collateral ligament, the LCL, uh, you don't see too many injuries of that. But the medial collateral ligament, MCL, maintains medial stability by resisting valgus forces or preventing knee joint abduction. So you'll usually commonly see uh, the tri terrible triad. So you'll get an ACL injury with an MCL uh, tear and a medial meniscus tear because that's basically uh, the shearing forces that occur. Injuries occur commonly, particularly in contact or collision sports. Teammate or opponent may fall against the lateral aspect of the knee, causing medial opening of the knee joint and or external rotation, resulting in stress to the medial ligamentous structures. Very common. Okay, football, I would say that's probably the most common. So, yep, there you go. See, fall there, and then yikes. Ah, here's a hyperextension. Ooh, no good. RG3, man. Poor guy. Feel bad for him. He had so such good high hopes, right? <laughs> and then yeah, see somebody lands on it. Ugh, that's no good. That's ACL, MCL, meniscus, ACL, MCL, meniscus probably. Uh, this one hyperextension. He may get lucky, but who knows? Again, why would anyone play? Well, maybe for the money, maybe for the love of the game. But injuries like this is are tough to recover from. All right, you get a synovial cavity, supplies knee joint with synovial fluid, lies under the patella and between the surfaces of the tibia and femur, and called the capsule of the knee. So you can get uh, tenosynovitis, or you know, usually the synovium gets inflamed in the knee. That's very common. You have an infrapatellar fat pad, uh, lies posterior to the patellar tendon, uh, insertion point for synovial floats of tissue known as plica, and plica syndrome is very interesting because a lot of times uh, young uh, women actually get plica syndrome and it kind of mimics meniscus and it mimics uh, IT band and they really don't know what it is. But, and, but what happens is like the tissue folds on each other and it's, it's very hard to treat. Anatomical variant that may be irritated or inflamed, 
in playing with the injuries of overuse of the knee. So overuse, running, overuse, cutting, um, jumping. So there's a plica, and sometimes you get this snap and yeah, over the medial condyle and just snaps back and forth. Not much you can do about it. They can do surgery to remove it, but it's kind of a last resort. Uh, if you don't mind the snapping, it doesn't really affect the muscle strength or not. If you have severe pain, then obviously you want to do something about it. But if it's just the snapping, don't worry about it. Uh, bursa, bursitis. Uh, just to reiterate, what's the difference between tendonitis and bursitis? Tendonitis, they usually have pain with movement because tendons are tendons are attached to muscle. So that's a contractile. Uh, segment. Bursa is non-contractile, so they'll have pain at rest. So bursa, bursitis, you have pain at rest. Tendonitis, you have pain with movement. So there's more than 10 bursa located around the knee. Some are connected to the synovial cavity. And what do the bursa do? They absorb shock or reduce friction. Okay. The knee joint, the knee itself, extends to 180 degrees. Okay, so you... Uh, um, what they usually say is zero degrees of extension and then you can go a little bit into hyperextension to uh, 10 degrees flexion occurs to about 150 degrees so what i would say instead of knee extends to 180 degrees you want to call it that the knee is at zero degrees okay and flexion is about 150 degrees so okay so that would occur right about here so if you can touch your heel to your butt you have about 150 degrees with knee flex 30 degrees or more, you get interrotation of approximately 30 degrees and extra rotation of approximately 45 degrees occur. So I'm going to show you a little video. Uh, the knee screw home, screws home to fully extend owing to the shape of the medial femoral condyle. As the knee approaches full extension, the tibia must externally rotate approximately 10 degrees to receive proper alignment. Okay, In full extension, due to close congruency, it took no appreciable rotation of the knee occurs. So when your knee is fully extended, there's no uh, uh, rotation. But as the knee approaches full extension, the tibia must actually rotate roughly 10 degrees. Sometimes you lose this rotation and sometimes after surgery, and sometimes we have to work on that. So terminal knee extension exercises are good to kind of get. All right. During initial flexion for full extension, the knee unlocks by the tibias rotating internally to a degree from its externally rotated position to achieve flexion. I showed that. That can be 10 to 20 degrees. Everyone's a little bit different, so it can vary from 10 to 20 degrees here. All right. It's not the end of the day. This is just break time.